In my experience, students in math classes get a different impression of how math is used than engineers actually use it in practice. An engineer's emphasis is usually on deciding what kind of math to use to model a specific process. It's called creating a mathematical model. In this video, I'll talk about the basics of what a mathematical model is. Mathematical modeling is the process of creating mathematical equations that predict the behavior of a physical system. It's generally explained in terms of block diagrams like this. This is called a systems level approach. The block represents a system, which is just a generic term for some physical device or a collection of devices. Signals are physical parameters like voltage, current, pressure, flow rate, or heat flux. They're the way that systems interact with each other and with their environment. In this block diagram, U of T and Y of T are generic signals. Inputs to a system are indicated by an arrow entering the block. Inputs can be considered to be applied to the system from outside the system. As an example, in a car, the input could be how much you push on the gas pedal. Outputs from the system are indicated by an arrow leaving the block. The output is provided by the system to the outside environment. The output from a car could be the car's speed. So, you can deflect the gas pedal as an input to the car, and the car responds by changing its speed. The inputs and outputs are not unique. As an engineer, you can define them pretty much however you want to. An alternate input to the car could be the slope of the road. If you're going uphill, the car will slow down, and it'll speed up if you're going downhill. When you create a model of a system, you're determining the output as a function of the input. Now we can kind of ignore the physical device that the system originally was. This gives us a powerful tool for quantifying the behavior of a system. But we also need to keep in mind the limitations of our mathematical model. Don't trust your mathematical model too much. One final note, the mathematical model has both dependent and independent variables. Dependent variables are expressed as functions of independent variables or each other. For example, when driving a car, the distance you travel would depend on how fast and how long you drive. Distance and speed are dependent variables, while time is an independent variable. Identifying independent and dependent variables is a prerequisite to determining any mathematical model. This slinky, for example, could be a system. If I suspend it like this, my input could be the motion of the top of the slinky, and the output's the motion of the bottom of the slinky. So if I move this, the output oscillates around, and that's my response. Alternately, I could fix the top of the slinky and have the input be the motion of the bottom of the slinky. My output could be, for example, the force in the slinky. So if I move this down, the force increases. If I move this up, the force decreases. Now I've strung the slinky across the room. I can apply an input at this end by plucking the end. I'll get a wave that propagates back and forth across the slinky. An alternate input could be oscillating the end of the slinky up and down, in which case I get this sinusoidal waveform. The slinky behaves differently depending on what our inputs and our outputs are and how we support the slinky. We have to choose a mathematical model that describes each of those cases, which can be very different. Once we've determined the appropriate mathematics to model a system, we can solve the equations for a specific input to predict the system response to that input. This step, which is necessary but boring, is what you do in your traditional math classes. Now let's take a look at how modeling, analysis, and design fit into an overall engineering process. This is important because we usually learn math in an environment where the mathematics itself is of primary importance. As engineers, the math is just a tool to help us understand the real world. There's kind of a fundamental difference between how engineers use math and how we're taught to use math. It's fundamental for engineers to work in two domains simultaneously. There's the real world of physical devices and the mathematical world where we model the real world and quantify what's going on. The engineering process usually starts with at least some idea of what the physical system looks like. This might be a preliminary design, for example. We usually start by creating a mathematical model of this system. This model is also preliminary, and it represents our first guess as to what we think will be important about this system. We're now in mathematics land rather than in the real world. 
In mathematics land, we can analyze the system to see what we think the physical system will do. Depending on the complexity of the mathematical model, we can either do hand calculations to analyze the system or simulate the system response using a computer. We'll likely use the analysis and the preliminary design to build prototype hardware and test it. One huge benefit of this early testing is to make sure that our mathematical models are actually predicting what's happening. So we'll probably test this system under conditions that we can analyze and modify our model as necessary to make the model agree with the test data. This process is called model correlation or validation. This step is crucial because we're going to use this model to finalize the system design and we don't want to use a model that doesn't reflect reality. Once we've got some confidence that the math we're using actually predicts reality, we can use the math model to modify this original design. In this step, we know what kind of response we want from the system. We can now use our math model to evaluate what to change about the system to get that desired response. At this point, we've got a new design that, on paper at least, does what it's supposed to do. The next step is to implement the design in the real world and test that design. Generally, this step will show us that we left something out of the original math model or didn't model our design changes correctly. We'll use this test data to re-correlate the model and make additional changes to the design. This process of modifying the design and testing the changes continues until the thing works the way we want it to do. System design is always iterative meaning that you make the best guesses you can, check to see if they work, and then change the design to make it work better. The model of the system doesn't eliminate the guesswork process, but it does give you a tool to better understand the consequences of changes and make better choices about what to change. There's a lot of latitude in how an engineer might model a system. A standard joke is that if you get five engineers to model a system, you'll get five different models. Of course, if I'm one of the engineers, you'll probably get at least six different models because I'll want to do the problem more than one way. Now let's talk about some of the types of models we might want to create, what physical processes they model, and the mathematics used in the models themselves. First and simplest are models of systems that either don't store energy or where the energy stored is constant. A situation like this could be where a car is moving at a constant velocity. Since the velocity is constant, the energy is constant. These systems are governed by algebraic equations. Another, more interesting class of systems is where the energy is being transferred between energy storage elements. These are called dynamic systems. For example, if you apply the brakes in your car, the kinetic energy is dissipated as heat in the brake pads. Energy is being exchanged within the system. There are several varieties of dynamic systems, and the amount of effort required to model and analyze them varies widely. The simplest type of dynamic system model is called a lumped parameters model. In these models, the energy storage elements are concentrated in certain places as lumps. For our car example, we generally don't need to worry about different parts of the car having different velocities. We can just lump the entire car into one big mass with a single velocity and get an accurate representation of the energy in the car. These types of models are governed by ordinary differential equations in which there is only one independent variable. In general, using a lumped parameter model implies that the rate of change of the input is slow relative to how fast the system can respond. If we run our car into a brick wall, the car crumples. Different parts of the car are traveling at different speeds and we can't lump the mass all together. That means that the energy transfer is a function of two independent variables. Models of this type are called distributed parameters models. These types of models are governed by partial differential equations, which are considerably more difficult to deal with than ordinary differential equations. So it's desirable to use lump parameters models if at all possible. Distributed parameters models are used when the input changes faster than information can propagate through the system. There are a few other qualifiers that can affect the difficulty of the modeling and analysis of a system. These apply to all of the above systems. First, linear systems are great. Engineers much prefer to analyze linear systems over nonlinear systems. In linear systems, a plot of the relationships between any two dependent variables will be a straight line. 
In nonlinear systems, plotting dependent variables against one another may not be a straight line. Nonlinear systems are painful to analyze, so engineers tend to assume systems are linear whenever possible. This assumption is one reason that the modeling and design process is iterative. All systems are nonlinear to some extent. We generally don't know how wrong we are until we get some test data. At that point, we may need to find that we redo the analysis or the design. One final category is time varying systems. These types of systems change their behavior as a function of time, which means that the coefficients of the governing equations will be functions of time rather than constants. This also increases the factor of difficulty in analyzing a system. Most of these system types can be mixed and matched. A lumped parameters linear system model with constant coefficients won't be too difficult to deal with but you really don't want to get stuck with a nonlinear distributed parameter system with time varying coefficients. If you end up having to deal with one of those, try to go on vacation or maybe pretend you're dead and hope it gets reassigned to someone else. Now let's take a look at these mathematical relationships in the context of a simple system, a slinky. If I fix the top of the slinky at the roof and displace the bottom of the slinky, this is my input. And the force in the slinky, if I choose that as my output, is just a function of the distance. It's an algebraic equation. There's no energy transmission within the system. If I suspend the slinky from one hand, and my input is the displacement at the top of the slinky, and my output is the displacement at the bottom of the slinky, I now have two energy storage elements. I have a spring that stores energy as displacement and a mass that stores kinetic energy as velocity. So I have two energy storage elements, which means this is governed by a second order differential equation. I can use a lumped parameters model because the spring is always either stretching or contracting. All parts of the spring are behaving the same at any time. And the mass down here is always going in the same direction at any given time. If I stretch the slinky this way, and pluck one end, I have a wave going back and forth. Not all parts of the slinky are behaving the same way. I would have to use a distributed parameters model for this. Likewise, if I oscillate this end of the slinky in this direction, the system response is a function of both time and space. This requires a partial differential equation. It is a distributed parameter system. Modeling engineering systems is challenging, but it's super rewarding. I love being able to predict how the system is going to work and being able to tell people how to change the system to make it work better.